This episode is the story of the uprising of a continent, but also of the birth of a sea in a hallucinatory prehistoric landscape, which, a few millennia ago, was crossed by one of the most powerful rivers our planet has ever known. For this river to be born, a world had to die or start melting. The story begins a little more than 20,000 years ago, at the end of the last glacial maximum. The average global temperature is 10 degrees cooler than today. Almost everywhere worldwide, high latitudes are covered in ice. In North America, a colossal ice sheet, the Laurentide Ice Sheet, covers almost all of what is now Canada. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic, the enormous Fenoscandian Ice Sheet presses down with all its weight. Northern Europe, from Ireland to Eastern Scandinavia, stretching south to Denmark, Northern Germany and Poland. The extent of this ice monster, which in some places is nearly three kilometers thick, is so vast that it would have been possible to travel across it. From southern Great Britain to Franz Josef Land in the Siberian Arctic, spans over 4,500 kilometers almost straight and without crossing any land exposed to open air. On a global scale, these tens of millions of cubic kilometers of water trapped as solid ice on the continents caused the average sea level to drop by nearly 120 meters, exposing all around the world vast portions of the shallow continental shelf. It was there at what would become the English Channel. 20,000 years ago, the last glaciation began and the world slowly started melting. For a few thousand years, this continent had, in the open air, Europe's most powerful river, possibly the world's at that time. At first gradual and moderate, the thaw, which would last for nearly 5,000 years, led to the formation of a vast network of small streams, rivers and large rivers. At first, lazily winding through the great European plains, these meltwaters, seeking an ocean to flow into, continue on their way. They encounter basins in the landscape formed by countless lakes which, once filled, overflow so that eventually this entire river network ends up finding an outlet at the bottom of the North Sea, which was dry at that time. There all the rivers merge together. We're talking about the prehistoric ancestors of the Seine, the Saône, the Solon, the Thames, the Rhine, the Weather and the Elbe, who join forces to give birth at the English Channel's mouth to a large river. A water monster from another time, which flowing more than 100 meters below the current ocean levels would empty several hundred kilometers further west into the Atlantic Ocean. The watershed of this prehistoric mega river is thought to have reached its greatest extent. It alone concentrated the deep waters from most of Central Europe and almost all of the waters from the glaciers covering the British Isles, Scandinavia and the Alps. It was then about 1.2 million square kilometers, that is, similar in size to the current Mississippi River system, making it the largest drainage basin to have ever drained the European continent. And when the temperatures rose even higher, the volume of water drained through the cracks did the same, eventually becoming truly torrential. Imagine the immense volumes that could surge through this narrow area in summer. Consider that when the thaw intensified. This roaring river, fueled by nearly all European glacier meltwater, likely had an outflow twice as large as the Amazons, even during the Amazon's floods. During the most intense thaw phases, at least 3,000 cubic kilometers of water were involved. That is, in terms of volume, the equivalent of 300 times Lake Geneva, which flowed out through here every year. It is believed that, throughout the last deglaciation, the water carried by this single giant prehistoric river contributed to a rise of 20 meters of the global sea level all over the planet, which largely contributed to the reclaiming of these lands by the Atlantic Ocean. And yet, despite the colossal amounts of turbulent bottom water that passed through here, the immense Manche River, considering its power, left only a few marks in the geological layers that now lie at the bottom of the sea, when it should have carved deep notches into the continental shelf, leading it all the way to the Atlantic. This peculiarity is largely due to the presence of giant lakes throughout the continent, along glacier edges, and especially in the center of the North Sea. The largest suspected to exist likely formed at the start of the last major glaciation, at the level of the central trench halfway between the English and Danish coasts. And it would have served, in a way, as a buffer zone between the roaring waters of the overflowing rivers and the calmer waters of the terminal giant. 
Thus, in this giant basin, the speed of the tributary currents would have lost intensity and a large part of the highly abrasive sediments would have settled. Once calmed, the massive water volumes would have continued more slowly, overflowing onto the gently sloping continental shelf to give birth to a giant deprived of most of its power and somewhat calmed. And it is also the existence of this lake, tempering the energetic meltwater, that would help explain why. We currently find the same species of freshwater fish in rivers that are several hundred kilometers apart, such as the Thames and the Rhine today. Rivers that all once flowed into this area and were thus connected. Now, if you're a bit frustrated to learn that this river wasn't despite its powerful flow, able to carve deep cuts into the continental shelf. Tell yourself to feel better that this flood from another era actually happened several times and intermittently. The landscapes I've described are simply the latest in a long series. A series that saw prehistoric rivers live and die to the rhythm of periods of accelerated thawing and slower coolings that have continued for 2.6 million years without pause. A period when, for the first time, several kilometers of ice built up over the British Isles and Scandinavia. Between that time and today, the giant river was more or less dormant for almost three quarters of the time. Before coming out of each glaciation and after spending 40,000 to 100,000 years hibernating. Suddenly brought back to life, awakened by the overwhelming power of raging bottom waters that, in just a few centuries, made it overflow its banks. Each sudden phase of thaw and warming carved into the landscapes as it thawed its own unique river network, made up of a web of gigantic torrents of water, mud and sediments, partially erasing the traces left by its predecessors. Before the biting cold returned, reducing to almost nothing the amount of liquid water flowing through the north of the continent. It is believed this occurred periodically during five of the last ten ice ages. So cold that the giant English Channel River could, for several centuries, be little more than a mere trickle of water or even, exceptionally, become completely dried up. Oddly, as warming sped up just over 15,000 years ago, the river lost some tributaries. Likewise, surely, some of its grandeur. When, a few thousand kilometers east of its mouth, as the glaciers retreated, meltwater that once fed it began to flow into the ancestor of the Baltic Sea. In this region, a lake as vast as a sea is emerging, because it is unable to reach the ocean by the western route, whose access is blocked by the high terrain. The meltwater accumulates, first forming vast lake systems, which gradually grow larger and merge together, to the point of forming a giant prehistoric lake. And Silas, which at its maximum extent was much larger than the Baltic Sea is today. This lake will stay here for millennia, before slowly flowing towards the ocean, then being invaded by it and becoming a sea. The so-called Litorina Sea, which at that time formed a vast expanse of brackish water and was, strangely enough, also 25% larger than the Baltic Sea is today. And this even though the ocean levels at that time had more or less reached those of today. In fact, if the Baltic Sea has shrunk in size, it's because the rising water was matched by the rising of the land. You heard right! In this part of the world, the shores are strangely rising faster than the sea. And while almost everywhere else on the planet, coastal regions have seen much of their land slowly reclaimed by the sea due to melting glaciers. Here, in Scandinavia, the land area has increased. And that's because a large part of this region is literally rising. Deformed for tens of thousands of years by the overwhelming presence of a colossal mass of ice pressing down on them with all its weight, the rocks, still bearing the memory of this, are now, once the ice cap has disappeared, undergoing vertical movements. Just like a piece of memory foam rubber that has been pressed down on for too long. Here, the masses are measured in billions of tons, and the material being deformed is none other than the surface of the Earth itself. After bending under the weight of the ice, it intends to regain part of its original shape. And now the Earth's crust, freed from the masses of ice that were crushing it after having sunk, begins to rise again. Thus, in all the regions of the world where kilometers thick ice disappeared during the last great glaciation, the ground has slowly risen and continues to do so.
even today, several thousand years after the ice has retreated or has greatly thinned. This rebound effect occurs in northern Canada, Antarctica, and Scandinavia, or nearly 8,000 years after the ice has completely melted. The ground continues to rise at a rate of nearly one centimeter per year, a speed that may seem slow to you, but one meter per century is more than enough for its effects to be noticeable within a human lifetime, and even more so across generations. So long before this strange phenomenon of isostatic rebound was understood, the inhabitants of these regions had already begun to ask themselves some questions. Before the 18th century, Swedes believed sea levels were dropping. This changed after Anders Celsius. Yes, he's the one who gave his name to the degree. He had the idea to have graduations marked on rocks along the shore at several places along the Swedish coast. That's when people realized. As strange as it may seem, it's not the sea that's receding, but the land that's rising. This happens faster or slower, depending on how much ice crushed these areas thousands of years ago. You are now seeing on the screen the Scandinavian coastline as it was about 7,000 years ago, when the sea level was almost the same as today and the region, which was just beginning to rise, was still underwater. Since then, this region has kept rising in altitude, reaching today's levels in southern Finland. The shores of the ancient Ancelis Lake are 60 meters above the level of the Baltic Sea. To the west, the Stockholm Archipelagos and the Gulf of Ursa further north have risen from the sea, with uplifts reaching nearly 100 meters in some areas. Based on global positioning system data, it has even been calculated that, due to these post-glacial rebounds, the total area of Finland is currently increasing by about 7 square kilometers per year. It must be said that the extreme viscosity of the rocks in the Earth's mantle makes them slow to react. This uplift is expected to continue for a long time, though it will gradually slow down. For about 10,000 years, rocks definitely have a long memory. Now, if you doubt the ability of a thick layer of ice to affect something that looks as solid and rigid as stone, consider that in the area of Hudson Bay, where about 20,000 years ago, at the height of the last ice age, the ice sheet covering Canada was about 5 kilometers thick. The underlying ground sank by nearly a kilometer. And after reaching such heights, let's take a step back to look at something that might be even crazier than these uplifts. Namely, that the disappearance of the ice might have fueled the fire, or rather the magma that was smoldering beneath it. Indeed, by looking into the volcanism of that era, it was found that it had significantly decreased under Iceland and Greenland. If not vanished entirely when these areas were overtaken by ice, it is believed that the reasons for this dormancy are to be found in the increased pressure exerted by the weight of the ice which would have come to smother the conditions for the formation and rise of magma. On the other hand, the disappearance of the ice caps could, by lifting the lid, increase the frequency of certain eruptions in these regions by 10 times in the future. And since the absence of ice could very well be able to reignite the fire, I think it's high time for this episode to end. 